Hey, Book Sleuths, I'm Frida. And I'm Casey. And this is the BSXOXO podcast. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. We are doing Throne of Glass, books two and three, the long awaited for us <laughs> <laughs> recap for you guys. Yes. So Crown of Midnight and Air of Fire, we were going to do just Crown of Midnight, just like how we did Throne of Glass book one as a standalone. And we actually did. We recorded the whole thing. And then we thought, man, our energy was so low. And like, we did not actually super enjoy this book. Like there were a lot of big moments that happened and there were moments that were good, but there was no real passion for us. So we decided because we heard so much about Air of Fire being so much better. And that's the one where it really grabs you. We decided that we would just combine the two and we did. And actually turns out the people were right and Air of Fire grabbed us. And so that's why we're doing a combined moment. Yes, definitely. Yeah, we just felt like Crown of Midnight, there wasn't enough. It was kind of like an in-between buildup. So for those of you who have already read the series, we felt like it didn't need its own standalone mm -hmm. yeah. recap. I will say, Frida, because I know that you just finished Queen of Shadows and I'm almost done. I think I'm like at 80%. I feel like the fandom says Air of Fire and Kingdom of Ash, I see, are like always at the top of people's list for like their favorite in the series. And I feel like Queen of Shadows to me is better than Air of Fire. It's more interesting. Uh, agreed. I read it in what, like a week? Like I couldn't put it down. I forced myself to put it down multiple times because I'm like, you're reading too fast. You're reading too fast. <laughs> like, because, you know, as we do these full book recaps, I want to like, have it fresh so that when we record my passion is still there and actually like it's a little bit of a hindrance that I read it so damn fast before we recorded this one because now I'm like fuck don't input anything that's in queen of shadows into this <laughs> section because those are spoilers and we're not there yet right at this moment in this podcast so but yeah so far I agree with you so era fire prior to reading Queen of Shadows was my favorite out of all of the books out of Assassin's Blade and then uh one two and three however yeah, Queen of Shadows, 100% so far was my favorite. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, we'll see what happens. I have a feeling, well, based on the reactions of everyone with Kingdom of Ash, I'm sure I have no doubt that could replace Queen of Shadows as the top. It seems like that's going to be a very emotional read that I'm just not fucking ready for. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we have like a little bit before it, right? What's even the next book in the series after Queen of Shadows? Gosh. I don't know. There's Empire Tower of Storms and Tower of Dawn. I don't know which order they're in, but those are the other two. And those are the ones that people will buddy read, which I'm still like, do I want to do that? I don't know. I know that people are highly recommending that we do that, but also that's just a lot of work to keep track of when to like flip back and forth. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm definitely going to do the tandem read for sure. Um, how are you going to keep track? Like, what is, what have you decided? Like, I know there was like a chart. What is your decision on like how you're going to keep track of that? Um, or like, you know, where are you going to keep it? Like your screensaver on your phone? Are you printing it out? Like, that's you know a what good I mean? Question. I don't know. I'll probably just take a screenshot. Um, maybe I'll print it out. I don't know. I haven't really thought that hard about it. Well, I guess because I'm not there yet. So <laughs> yeah, well, and maybe, yeah, that's been my entire reasoning. Like, how am I going to like, I would need it to be heavily accessible because it's like, if I remember it, and I haven't seen it in a minute, but it's like you read two chapters and you switch over and maybe you're only reading one and then you're going to the next one. And it's like, you know, sometimes maybe you're reading five or 10 chapters. Like, I don't know. And so it's like, I would have to keep it really handy dandy notebook style close to me. Um, yeah, I think because I will get the physical books, perhaps I will just like take little markers and then I'll like <gasps> mark the chapters so that I know when to flip. That's a really good idea. And actually, because I have the ebook, I wonder if I could do that too. Like I'll just highlight somewhere. Hmm. Wow. You're fucking smart. Now I might, <laughs> now I'm feeling more open to it because like it requires I, a little bit of prep, I guess. Yeah. A little bit of prep and then we're okay. All right. Okay. 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 I feel better about it. Okay. Really fast before we move on, because I always forget, I just wanted to ask you guys, if you enjoy our podcast and you like watching us or listening to us, can you please, um, follow us, subscribe to us so you can always hear our beautiful faces because here are beautiful faces. That's fine. <laughs> um, we get, we, 
<laughs> cannot even take my own self seriously. We do post bonus content sometimes. So like, you know, we have our Monday episodes and then we have our end of the month Thursday, Thirsty Thursday episode. But we also do sometimes put out bonus ones. Also, if you could give us a rating, that would be phenomenal. Um, the more ratings we have, the more viewers and listeners can actually find us. You know, we're put more up on that uh, platform when people search books or comedy book podcast or whatever it is that they're looking for. We are more likely to be up in there where they can actually find us. Um, if you give us a rating, and right now that's our biggest goal, is just to show people that we exist. We want to make reading fun again, and uh, the best way to do that is to show that it is fun, and so we need people to find us. Definitely. Um, I feel like it is interesting. I was reading about it. It seems like the younger generation, like book talk has like, especially I guess in the pandemic, like when people were getting, I mean, they were bored and they were trapped inside. So there's been this huge resurgence of like reading, which is when like all of this, the court of thorns and roses, like blew the fuck up. And there's this whole new community, not to say that it didn't exist before, but, um, there's a lot of people attributing that TikTok plus pandemic era of like, mm -hmm. you know, bringing books back, which is cool. Cause I mean, both of us are like kind of newer again to like getting into reading. So, and it's yeah. just been so fucking fun. Mm -hmm. Like where, where have we all been? Like, what the <laughs> fuck have we all been doing these last like 10, 15 years? You know what I, I know. mean? <laughs> I do. And actually I saw online, like there are a lot of people just like us where, uh, last year in particular, they were like, I hadn't read in like 10, 15 years. And I finally decided to read a court of thorns and roses usually is that one that like is the catalyst. Um, and then after that, they are just obsessed. Now I did read a few books before reading a court of thorns and roses. And I was starting to get back into reading. I definitely read more than I did in my whole 10 years prior to reading A Court of Thorns and Roses, I had read maybe four books before it. So that's what I mean. Like I did not read for a while. If it wasn't underwriting guidelines or an article on the news, I wasn't reading it really at all. So anyway, once I read A, Qu a Court of Thorns and Roses, the rest was history. Like I could not not read anything. I read, I don't even remember, 40 or 50 books or something uh, between April and end of the year last year. And that's a lot. That's a lot of books. That is a lot of books. Yeah. So anyway, there are a lot of people like us out there and we want to spread the word that we exist. So yeah. Let's just reading. all, not even just spread the word. We just want to like build a reading community of like, you know, fun, yep. sassy readers who want to have like <laughs> talk about all the book tings. So anyway, all the book tings. Also, my goal is next year, I want to have a retreat for like 15 to 20 people. If we do get wildly outrageous, maybe we will go ahead and do like a bigger one. But my goal is to have like a 15 to 20 people come together and do like a fun retreat where you just pay like one fee. We'll take care of the rest. We'll feed you. We'll give you drinks. Um, we'll have the activities. We'll do everything. And a lot of it will include just having moments where we can lounge and read, hang out by the water, whether it be a pool or a beach or whatever. I don't know. We haven't decided, but it's something that I definitely want to do. So we want to, we want to, again, spread and build this really fun community, make friends, family, all of that stuff. Yeah. Bring readers outside of just the internet world. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, we can get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 all right. Do you want to, um, well, if you guys have read Throne of Glass, do we really need to introduce Crown of Midnight Air of Fire? Well, maybe what we'll do is just like a brief moment where I'll just say, just as a refresher, Crown of Midnight is the one where Selena Sardothian? Sardo 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 That's how I read it, but you okay. listen to it. So how do they say it? I don't know, Sardothian, Sardothian, I don't remember, but either way, Selena is now the king's champion and the king has sent her like on all these missions and she's saying that she's done it, but she hasn't actually, um, she is sent to kill this dude Archer, but she knows him because he's a courtesan and, you know, she's an assassin. So they were buddies, whatever kind of buddies. Um, it's the one where she and Kale kiss and like are falling in love but then Nehemia dies and then she blames Kale because he could have helped prevent it. And then 
she opens a gate and then she turns it to Faye for a moment. And then Kale sees that and he's like, yeah, she's a monster. And Dorian has magic. Um, and then she goes away to Winland. No, wait, West with Mistward. Well, they send her to Wenlin and then Wendland. Rowan takes her to Mistward. This is now Air of Fire. Okay. So she's on a ship. Now, Air of Fire is the one where we discover Selena is now Aelin, which we did discover that actually at the end of Crown of Midnight. Um, she's going on a mission to kill the royal family in Windguard, and she's like, fuck you, I'm gonna burn up on the Windguard. Windguard, what's the word? <laughs> Words are hard today. Wendland. Uh, I'm gonna let you finish this a very quick <laughs> recap to remind people what books we're talking about. Okay, I just feel like to recap Air of Fire in a nutshell, Aelin basically works on harnessing her like fire power with Rowan up in Mistguard. Um, she comes to terms with her identity. Dorian is wrestling with his loyalties. He teams up with Adian, who we find out is Aelin's cousin. You mean Kale. You said Dorian. Oh yeah, Kale. Words are hard, you guys. Kale. <laughs> established okay yeah 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 that 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 that, that. um <laughs> and i think this is the book we really start to understand more about like what these darker creatures are it's, there are vogue princes that are uh, going to be a part of the king's army and they are like wreaking havoc you know trying to take the bodies of like demi fey and there are princes. And at the end of this book, Dorian basically gets one of those prince collars put on him. And um, Kale yeah. has to like, he, Kale breaks all of his oaths, all those things. And he flees so that he can figure out what the fuck to do about the Dorian situation. And then Aelin is on her way back because she's just announced herself and like, is going to go deal with the mess of everything. Yes. Okay. okay. There's your introduction. There's your refresher on what it is now. We're just going to jump into um, our song choices, who we're casting for the top main characters, and then just talk about some heavy hitting moments, trivia, and then that's it. So here we go. All right. Song. We each chose a song. And funny enough, the lyrics of the songs are actually very similar. We are not allowed to play the music for you guys, but we will tell you the names. And then on Instagram, I'll post what the songs are again. So you can give them a listen if you want to. Casey, you want to share your song? Yeah, we feel like these would be like the, I don't know, what would it be? Like the trailer song, theme song, something like mm -hmm. that, or the anthem, I guess for both of them. Yeah. So I chose... Why the fuck can I ever remember what this one's called? Oh, do or die, do, do or die by um, uh, Afrojack and Thirty Seconds to Mars. Um, I feel like maybe millennials, especially if you liked electronic music, should know that song. But anyways, I just felt like it really um gets the mood and the vibe more so for I felt like more so for like Aelin slash Selena. It mm -hmm. felt like a song for her more than anything, but it is applicable to all of them in my personal opinion. Yeah, I think that everybody goes through these dark moments and uh, the storms in their minds and all of that. So, yes, I agree. And then my song is called Madness by Ruel, I think is her name, R-U-E-L-L-E. -E. Um, uh, yeah, both of these are very like, uh, you know, it's like madness anger but you're having to hold it in there's a storm raging inside of you um and you're like trying to run from it or whatever so that's that's what the shang shard are very good i really like these songs and how amazing are these artists yeah they're really good they're very vibey i feel like mine is like yours is like a like just like a notch more moody i feel like Mm -hmm. um which I like too so yeah I think they're both really good fits yeah that moody one that I found I was like ooh, I could just imagine like listening to this like get a nice stark bathroom some really good candles and maybe not even a book just like sit there with your thoughts if you're in a grumpy mood and you just listen to the moody. yeah sometimes you need a song to help you feel all your feels you know 
Yeah, I do know. I watched a movie even yesterday when I was like, I probably shouldn't watch this. It sounds sad. And I was sobbing the entire time, like rubbing my chest. And I was like, should I turn it off? No, I'm not going to turn it off. I'm going to continue this pain. (laughs) And sometimes I feel like it's the same thing with music. Like when we're sad or whatever, we listen to these songs and they might make us sadder, but sometimes you just need that. You need to play a song that will make you feel things that you maybe don't need to, you know, accelerate the feelings of, but you know, yellow. (laughs) I do know. I don't know. I feel like sometimes it's hard to feel the feelings. Like, I don't know. I'm not good at, (laughs) I'm not a good crier. So sometimes I feel like if I have to, I don't know, whatever. Sometimes you just need something to like put you in the right mood to get your feelings out. Yeah. I get that. Encourage the feelings. I am a crier. And so (laughs) I have no business doing it then. (laughs) No, no, no. Everybody has business doing it. And I think it's a good thing that you're a crier because you're good at getting those emotions like out of your system. You're not repressing them. So one out of 10 for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we're onto the character casting and rating. So in our first episode, Throne of Glass, we already casted um, multiple characters. So all we're doing in this one um, is casting the new main people. So Adian, Rowan, Manon, Astrid, and Maeve. We know that there are many more characters. However, there are so many new ones. We chose the main ones for us. When we do the Queen of Shadows, if there are some repeat characters from you know this book that come forward into queen of shadows well of course we can cover them as well um but as of up to this point these are the people we're casting if you want to see the cast or hear the cast of throne of glass as a refresher of like who we chose for dorian selena all of that just go to our instagram in the highlight reels we have um the throne of glass cast there for you yes so we um adding to our cast did you already say who we added yeah but it's okay you can say it again um oh no 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 I don't need to say it again anyways okay so we'll just tell you who we (laughs) (laughs) um okay Okay. so Maeve Mav Maeve Maeve. I do this every fucking time it's Maeve M-A-V-E um okay Maeve we cast her as Kira Knightley um, you know, she's giving like, she's supposed to have like dark eyes, dark hair, obviously this is the interesting thing about Faye is like, they don't really age. I feel like after a certain point, but we felt like she should look a little bit more mature. She shouldn't look like, you know, a little 20 year old. So felt like Kira Knightley would be a good Maeve. Um, do you want to talk about, uh, Man- Manon? I can hate that, <clears throat> but I know <laughs> I it's don't accurate. like it either. So her name, like when I read it, it's Manon to me. I read it as Manon, but then I couldn't stand putting the book down. Wow. Words again, I couldn't stand putting the book down. And so I ended up purchasing the audio companion for it. And when I was listening to it, it says Manon and I'm like, Manon, Manon, what, what are we on? What is the man on top of? Like, I don't know. Like, actually I did have that moment when I was like, wait, what are they talking about? I didn't realize they were saying her name because to me, Manon was her name. So anyway, it is Manon. Can I say something about that too? Because it's like, there's no consistency because is it Brennan or is it Brannon? Brannon. Okay. See, so like, that's like the same, you know, N-O-N at the end. So how come it's Manon, Brannon and not Man and Brannon? I don't know. Maybe be, are there two N's in Brannon, Brannon, Brannon? I don't know. Okay. Sarah, get your ass over here and explain yourself. <laughs> We've got some problems with how you pronounce some names. We're also. not a fan of some of this. And if we're going to talk about names, of course, we're going to bring up Resand, Rysand. <laughs> We don't want to hear it. He'll always be rice to us. Always will be rice and. Okay. So, um, Manon or Manon and Astrin actually. So I want to touch both of them at the same time because you and I were kind of going back and forth also, uh, trying to decide. And actually I saw online, a lot of people liked this, uh, Sydney Sweeney for Manon. We chose her to go to Astrin, but I saw some people wanted her for Manon. We ended up choosing Emma Roberts for Manon. Um, As I'm reading the series, I don't know if that's the best choice. Like maybe when we do Queen of Shadows, if we find another actress, 
um, or even possibly a model that looks more Manon for us, we can switch it up. But as of now, we have Emma Roberts for Manon. We all know that she can play a really tough, cool, feisty role. We know that she's gorgeous. We know, you know, so she's like a really good fit. However, the Sydney Sweeney, I feel like is the same damn thing. She could do the same thing. Um, the characters Manon and Astrid are both supposed to be gorgeous anyway. I think all of the witches are beautiful um, as part of their like lore, lure, lure, <laughs> lure, how do you, Eller, Ellier, Allure. Allure. <laughs> I still can't <laughs> say it. I'm like, you said it, say it again. Let's hear it. Oh, uh, God damn it. This is like one of those things when you like now put me on the spot. Um, Allure. Allure. Yeah. <laughs> now it's one of those words that's just like sounds weird in general i'm like mm, that's something about that doesn't sound right it doesn't sound right well anyway they're supposed to like attract their prey you know it's like that word whatever we all know the word that i'm trying to say that casey can successfully say so anyway um i'm actually gonna post up on instagram um on our stories like who do you think like I guess, do you agree with like us keeping Emma Roberts for Manon versus Astrid? And do you agree with Sydney Sweeney being Astrid instead of Manon? And just see what the overall consensus is, because that was one thing we were kind of going back and forth on. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, we had cast, we did agree that like um, Emma Roberts could be Manon and um, Astrid could be Sydney Sweeney. But I will say, I do think as a leading role, well, kind of a sort of leading role. I do think Sydney Sweeney, I don't know, Frida, if you've seen her in anything, but I do think she's like a better actress. Like she's pretty high caliber. She's incredible. And she can really embrace the intense vibes. Um, and I feel like Asterin needs to be intense too, but she's a little bit more free spirited and wild. And I don't know. Hmm. I'm actually looking up Sydney Sweeney right now because I'm like, have I actually seen her in anything before? Um, I have not. I have not. So I just have to take your word for it. I've not seen any of these things. She's in a lot of stuff. Oh, oh Handmaid's you. Tale. Okay. I have seen her, I guess. Oh, yeah. But I don't remember who she is in that. So she had um, I think she really blew up from which I didn't I watched a few episodes of the show and I didn't uh it's not for me. But I think she really blew up after being in Euphoria, which is a huge show. And then she was in the first season of White Lotus, whatever. Anyways. Okay. Cool. So um Rowan, we thought that a young Chris Hemsworth could do him decently well. I feel like Frida, probably you've seen this too. I feel like a lot of people have cast um, Henry Cavill probably because they see him with the white hair as the witcher. So it's just really easy to associate the two. Mm -hmm. But um, we went with a young Chris Hemsworth for the uh, Rowan vibes. I also feel like he could have been, he could be, a, if I was a casting director, he could be a fun one to like find a new unknown. Agreed. Person. I feel like most of these, we'd have to find a new unknown person because- I don't know. I'm very interested to see because A Court of Thorns and Roses, that's a real one that is coming to Hulu at some point. And I'm very, very interested to see who they cast. And I wonder if they're going to go with mostly unknowns or if they're going to add in some people that we do know already. Um, also, on that note, if they're going to do A Court of Th Thorns and Roses, they're going to have to do Crescent City as well. Not to like say too much more than that, because I don't want to spoil anything, but I do feel like they would have to. Maybe. I think it depends on the success of the show because I mean, so tune out if you don't want any spoilers. Tune out. Um, so if they're starting with a Court of Thorns and Roses, it takes them a long time before they get to the blending. So like, let's say, I don't know how it's going to roll, but let's say they did like one season per book or something. If for whatever reason the book didn't, the series didn't go well, we would never get to Crescent City. True. I better fucking go well. <laughs> Don't fuck it up. I think they're going to need a really high, big budget. I almost feel like um, Crescent City would be easier to do live action just because it's in a modern world. So you don't have to like recreate a whole fantastical new realm. I don't know something about, 
I'm not saying I'm excited for Court of Thorns and Roses. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like Crescent City would have been easier to broach because you just, you know, Hollywood's got the whole big gun thing and like modern world, like whatever. It's so true. It'll Probably be interesting. I just yeah. there's more room for them to fuck it up is more what I think with not going that way, which I hope they don't. They better fucking not. They better not fuck it up. Don't be fuck pissed. You better not. Um, okay, we have one last person we casted. Adian. Good old Adian. Okay. Um, so we chose a Trevor Donovan. I hadn't really seen him before. I have two pictures that I'm gonna post up of him. Um so I mean he's I'm something. He is. Should we let's look it up? Trevor. I need to put this drink down. Good lord. What did I even say his name was? Good crap. What is happening? I guess okay. he's most known for I think the new the reboot of 90210. Okay. Prescription for love. Okay, so he's like in some of these kind of looking hallmarky ones. Um like okay, USS Christmas, Love Finds You Charm, Jingle Bell Princess, The Engagement, Charm, Aloha with Love. Yeah, so he's in a lot of these cuter um movies, but then Dancing with the Stars and 90210, yeah. Maybe, yeah, but that's over, huh? 2008 to 2013. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, we are going anyway. to tell you guys, um, of the newbies who are our two favorites and then who's our least favorite, um, Frida, should we just do, are we doing least favorite of the newbies or just least favorite in both books? Um, I think we could just do least favorite of, I think we could do most favorite and least favorite. Oh, fuck. I don't know. I know we talked about the new cast, but also yeah, the old yeah. cast is all still fully in here. So maybe we choose our favorites out of the new cast because obviously we should give them some credit. Otherwise, they'll be left in the dust. Um, and I don't I don't know. OK, so we're going <laughs> to two. So, OK, that sounds good. We're going to go with two favorites and the least favorite from the noobs. Okay, you oh, go first. God damn it. Okay. <laughs> I usually have to go first, so that's why you have all to right, go all first. All right, fine. Okay, so uh, number one for me is going to be Rowan. And then based on these two books that we've read so far, um, Adian's going to be number two for me. And then my least favorite of the noobs, like obvious choice, is going to be Maeve. And I know I'm almost positive that you're going to have a different number two than me, but let's hear it. Um, obviously my least favorite's Maeve. I feel like out of everyone, that's gotta be Avi. Um, but before I move on, I am curious. Cause we talked about this in, um, the first one, I think, Ugh, I don't even remember. Cause again, we recorded crown of midnight and then we ditched it, but Duke Harrington or the King, who do you think is worse after reading these two? Like, do you still feel like the King is the absolute worst? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's controlling Duke Parrington with a ring and he's like creating genocides. And yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> There's no question in my mind. It's funny because there was a moment where I was like, Duke Parrington is worse than the king. And it was because I was able to read some chapters from the king. I just got some attention from him. So I was like, I like him more. Like, it, I'm so weird. I don't know why. But yeah, I was like, when I think about it reasonably, obviously the king is worse. So I just, I wanted to bring it up because I just remember that being a moment for me when you were like, why the fuck are you choosing the Duke as worse than the king? Are you kidding me? And then you like laid out the path as to why the king is worse. And then I was like, Ooh, I am a toxic girly too. <laughs> no, okay, but in your defense, I do feel like we see more scenes, like we get more personal with Duke and like he's obviously a disgusting human being. So it's more like if you are to zoom out, it's easier mm -hmm. to then say king, but like with how zoomed in all the chapters get, we are we do get more intimate views of Duke Parrington and he is a piece of shit. He is a so. piece of shit. 100 the question the is was he a piece of shit before or after the ring i get the vibes that he was always a piece of shit i just feel like he must have always been yeah and maybe he doesn't have a ring on but i thought that he did no he does that, 
Yeah. Okay. He has a ring. Yeah. Cause okay. I remember there's like, you know, the glancing between the rings and who all had them and stuff. Um, which by the way, we didn't cast one guy, which I guess maybe he wasn't that important, but, um, he ended up, he was like the cousin or something and he ended up getting a ring. And I just remember, and this is more heavy hitting moment section, not that we wrote it down, but I just remember thinking like, is he a bad guy or is he a good guy? What was his name? Roland. Yeah. Roland. Couldn't remember like, oh, and I don't even remember what happened to him, but the whole yeah. time I was just thinking like, was he you- good or was he bad? We saw what happened to him in Queen of Shadows. Yeah, in Queen of Shadows. <laughs> you just said I don't even remember what happened to him. I know, but up to that point, like in these oh. books. Yeah, that's why I'm like, I don't remember. Like, I just remember he was there and he was pestering. And then Gosh. I don't remember what happened. He pretty much. So they put a ring on him and then he was complaining about headaches. And then he got shipped off with Parrington and Caltain. That's like the last that we had heard of him, I think, in Crown of Midnight. And then he didn't really come up in Air of Fire. Okay. Well, that's got to be why I was like, eh, I don't know. Because Crown of Midnight, I was like dragging my feet through that one. Okay. Top two favorites. Sorry. Um, Rowan, I'll have his number one. And okay, now I see where you're like, I don't know about your number two. Because I'm also like, I don't know about my number two. Oh, I thought I knew for sure what your number two is. Mm, Maeve, you called it. <laughs> just kidding. Manon, I, I feel like is my number two. I just really enjoy her. I am wearing the 13 sweatshirt, um, which I basically have lived in. I wore it like three <laughs> days in a row and I was like, I should probably wash this because I wanted to wear it for this episode. So I just, I washed it last night and I let it air dry. Cause I was like, no heat is touching this thing we're not <laughs> gonna destroy it it is like the softest most comfortable thing and it matches my nail polish color so anyway um which all in all just really cool okay um but yeah I do really like Adian too but I really enjoy Manon I love a redemption story and I just feel like there's so much of that going on with her um we can see some life coming into her eyes and all of that stuff so yep yeah. That's my final answer. We've got Rowan and we've got, excuse me, Manon. 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 Yeah. Adian's number two for me. And then we agreed on Maeve. So Yes. Yes. So that's our character ranking. Um, I guess let's just dive into heavy hitting moments. Let's do it. We'll do it. We'll start with Crown of Midnight and move our way. <clears throat> to era fire all right so um again as we've said since kind of midnight was kind of slow i feel like these heavy hitting moments don't really happen until later so the first one that we have marked down is the ceiling kale so for me I fucking knew. I just knew like, um, I think it was like, it didn't take super, super long. Like maybe it was like max, like halfway for Selena and Kale to start having their romance. Like things were going like really cute and sweet for them. And I just knew like, based on where we, where we were at in the book and like how much was left, I just fucking knew. I was like, this is all going to go to shit real fast. Like it, this is not going to last, like shit's going to go down. And it did. And Kale gets stolen away and it triggers all of the things, um, which Frida, I felt like you had, um, mentioned that you thought the ceiling of Kale was re-triggering in Aelin, you know, her loss of Sam. And like mm-hmm. that out of control. So how did you feel when Selena gets the letter about him being taken? Okay. So there were a lot of feelings that I had about this. And in fact, like, <clears throat> well, okay. So there was a scene from Nehemia where she's talking to Elena and talking about needing to like, um, encourage selena to like move on or like not move on but like move forward like basically stop being such a little b and step up i guess or whatever they get in a and big so fight. yeah she calls her a coward yeah, yeah, yeah um and so then he was like i'm gonna go ahead and do this whatever and so then right after kale is kidnapped and so immediately i'm like did nahemia do this like 
what's going on? Like, I totally thought Nehemia was the one that kidnapped him and I didn't understand why or like to what end, like why, why would she do that? Like what's going on? And also why does she care so much about Selena doing this? Like, I don't get it. Um, but yeah, when she actually went to like, go get him and save him, like a lot of the things that she was doing. And I think there was a lot of inner dialogue too, where she's just talking about Sam and like trying to, I don't know, get vengeance on him and whatever else. And I just, the whole time, I'm like, this is a trap. Like she's going to die or something's bigger is going to happen. Like did Kale actually get taken? Was he taken by the person that wrote the note? Like, I don't know. Like there was just a lot of mistrust in the situation and not knowing really what to do or what to think about it. Um, she was a badass in that scene. I felt like she hadn't been a badass in a little while with that. And then she was like a pure badass again. What did you think about it? Like having not read Assassin's Blade yet? Um, I mean, so I, Selena had still revealed a lot about like Sam, like he came up a lot and how he was like taken from her and murdered and we knew her parents were murdered and all that stuff. So, um, I guess maybe I didn't get the same level of detail of understanding but I still knew that like this was triggering for her she like talked about she got that like murderous calm so I don't know it's exactly what I expected from her I mean like you know I I think in my head I was like you fucking idiots I was like this is you guys are so stupid you took like Otterland's like top assassin you're fucking with her like if you want her help you idiots this is not how you go about it like I get that like she's being stubborn right now because as we know like they are rebels and she doesn't this is like a whole thing um and so they're trying to like trigger her to help them but it's like okay so if you can't reason with her taking the person she loves is not going to fucking work and you're going to lose your numbers so it's just like what the fuck were you thinking and also why did they care so much about her like I don't understand well and then we find like Nehemia was actually part of the rebel group too did Nehemia just say like hey Selena's really important and we really want her on our side because nobody knew that she was Aelin at that point like Ren and his uncle or dad or whoever he is the older guy like they're there we don't know it's them until like later but they're there and they have no idea that's Aelin, which also, how do they not fucking know that they can see her eyes and her hair color? How did nobody know? Um, well, maybe those were just like, I don't know. I mean, if you're not from Terrasan, like it sounds like there are a lot of people from different lands. Like you might not know that like the turquoise with the gold ring, like is a telltale sign. And also you'd probably have to be really fucking close to her to be able to like see that. Well, Ren and the older guy, they were from Terrasin. They were, they had lands or something there. Um, yeah, but they saw her in the dark. Mm, true. Okay, well, then that explains my question. They just couldn't <laughs> see her eyes because I'm like, how, like, for real, you guys, come on. And she's alien the whole time. She tricked us all. But again, like, Adian had the same eyes. So who's to say there weren't <laughs> other relatives in that same line that just had those eyes too? true that is true okay so stealing kale she saves him right and that feels great i actually at that point it's like cool 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 he's saved but actually now we have to hurry and like go save nehemia so when she went to like go try and hurry and save there's the moment where she's running as fast as she can kale is chasing her on horseback but cannot reach her or catch up to her like wow she's obviously fey, right but like her powers are coming out even though magic is banned so that was kind of interesting um but then so like I don't know like when Kale saved I don't think that I cared that much because we're immediately like scared for Nehemia and then of course all of that happens how did you feel about like finding Nehemia's body and like I don't know did you care much um yeah I did care I felt like um, I had a hard time digesting Selena's reaction and like how she was literally going to kill Kale, who like she was clearly falling in love with, and she just like mm-hmm. flipped a switch real quick on him. Um, so it was hard for me to understand 
the gravity of her reaction. Like nothing about her reaction made sense. Like it makes sense in a lot of ways um, in that it's really upsetting. I just don't understand how she could turn on a dime on somebody that, you know, even if she's not in love with him that she loves, like she loves this person as a human being. Like it's just, yeah, I was really um, feeling like she overreacted and how she treated Kale. Yeah, I agree. I was like, really, are we doing this right now? I felt like the whole situation was very dramatic and it made me sad because I actually really enjoyed their love story. So that sucked. I did think it was really fucking cool that Dorian used his magic in that moment to stop her. And also again, frustrated because she really would have fucking killed him, which is really annoying. (sighs) Selena, come on, Kale, you bitch. And you know, she would have ended up regretting that like that. Oh, for sure. Even because yeah. we've, yeah, it's just so interesting. Um, so then what happens? What else is the next big thing in Crown of Midnight? Mm, okay. So she discovers word keys and word marks. Oh, and yeah. We get she... to... Oh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. No, because I was still pondering. I was like filling the void with, and then she. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that really like the next big moment, I think for me, and you can back me up if you're like, I'm skipping something, but I'm like, meh, all the other stuff, meh, meh, meh. Like she's Mm -hmm. discovering the word keys with Dorian. Like it's fun, but there's nothing like overly exciting, I guess it comes to light more in air of fire, why it makes more sense, but they found one of those, the creature in the dungeons or whatever. Sounds like it was probably some, somebody who was possessed by some sort of valg. But anyways, I felt like the next cool moment was when we discovered that she's Faye, when she walks over that portal um, that she was trying to summon Nehemia through and it like was open too long or something. And the, I think like the word hound came out and more were like coming through so anyways she runs through there I think to go save her dog Fleetfoot or something and Kale and um it's revealed that she is in her fey form and I was like fuck yeah I'm like she's so badass look at her go like this is awesome and I was just (laughs) surprised that I'm like I'm like, how come Kale's not hyped? Like, why is he, shouldn't he, this is cool. What's his problem? This is so (laughs) cool. This makes her like even hotter. What the fuck's your problem? But instead he's like scared of her kind of like apprehensive. He was brainwashed. Totally. But yeah, we, it's, we can kind of understand that now, but anyways, what did you think Mm -hmm. of that moment? I thought that was such a cool moment and how powerful, powerful she was and like still how she put her dog and Kale ahead of all else. Um, I do think it was sad that Dorian didn't get to see her go into her fae form that there's like this overall or overwhelming feeling of like, let's protect Dorian or well, in that case, I think he was trying to protect her and she was like, stop fucking touching me and knocked him out so she could go do whatever she needed to do. So maybe she wasn't like, protecting him per se but throughout the story like we I just Dorian should be more involved like he should deserve to be so actually she didn't knock him out because he was getting in the way she knocked him out because she knew it was vital for him to stay alive like he could not be fucking and in the he couldn't be tampering with this mess because the king of Otterlan is such a terrible person also his Mm -hmm. brother's shitty like they had to be really careful about him or like we can't fucking risk him okay yeah Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, everybody's protecting Dorian, but he deserves to be part of it. Although, yeah, it's true. Like when you step back and you say what you just said, like, okay, yeah, because also we don't want his brother to go into um rain because his brother sounds like a fucking twat. A, twat. a true spawn. A true spawn. Um okay, so the moment when she was gonna let Archer go. Um which I actually like thinking about it further. I was like, she should not let him go. Like he's a fucking dick. Like he's gonna, you never let him go. You have to kill them. Otherwise they're just going to come back and bite you. Um, but then of course she didn't let him go because he said what he said. I don't even remember what it was, but I was like, Ooh, you did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> it was something about Sam. Yeah. What a motherfucker. Yeah. I said that. 
um yeah he did say something like she was gonna totally let him go and then he brought up sam somehow and then she was like that's it that's fucking it see now i'm curious i'm like okay i need to fucking know because it was like we i think that we figured this out last time i'm like he did he real he real fucked up yeah let's find it i will sing for you guys as she does it Selena said, you're a fool if you think I'll help you. And he said, oh, once my men start working on you, you'll soon change your mind. Roark Farron was a client of mine before he was killed. That is, you remember Farron, don't you? He had a special love for pain. He told me that torturing Sam Cortland was the most fun he ever had. And then she went, ha, and then a hi, and then she kicked him. Yeah. If you don't know what the reference is from, it's from Anastasia, the little bat dude. I gave her a ha and a hi yeah and I kicked her, sir. <laughs> oh, wait. Interesting. Oh, okay. I thought that she was going to let him go. So, yeah, she did say, you're leaving Rifthold tonight, you and all of your friends. And then he said, thank you. If I find you in the city, I'll kill you. Blah, blah, blah. He said, I knew you're a good, I knew you were a good woman. He said. Wait, when did she, did she kill her after, kill him after she, uh, he said the Sam thing? No, actually, she was going to let him go, but then he manipulated her one more time. Um, and she was like, that's it. He's done. It was when she said, I knew, he said, I knew you were a good woman, that Selena halted and turned. There was a hint of triumph in his eyes. He thought he'd won, manipulated her again. One foot after another, she walked back toward him with predatory calmness. And she said, no, I'm not. And then... Goodbye. Oh, oh, okay, oh and okay. then her last word to him as he like the daggers in him, and then she whispers, but Nehemia was. Oh dang. Dang, he dang, dang. Up. He messed up. Yeah, too much manipulation. So I guess it wasn't just the Sam. I was wrong. It wasn't just the Sam comment. I mean, that wasn't helping, but mm-hmm. she just kept seeing through his how manipulative he was. And she was like, you know what? You're a fucking problem. <laughs> <laughs> he was a problem. He deserved to go. Um, oh. So after that, Kale is kind of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like Kale is going back into protective mode over Selena. And he like convinces his dad, like he's like, I'll go back and I'll be your heir. I'll be your, I'll be the Lord. Just help me convince the king to like let her go. Not and let so her go. That, right? he, no, no, no. He was trying to convince the king, oh, it's a good idea to send Aelin over to Wenlin because I don't think the king had been able to get any of his forces over there yet. So it wasn't an area that had been breached. So he was like trying to make it seem like, go send your champion there, you know, have her kill the royalty or whatever. So he wanted his dad to back him on the suggestion, like with the council. So um, yeah just to get her out so yeah you're right like he wanted to get her out but he had presented it as like send your champion here for this reason yeah how did that make you feel were you like stoked about her going or were you like no you're risking yourself because of all like the deals like the king he said something to her like if you fuck up like i'm killing kale i don't even remember like the specifics but he was like he made it very clear that he'll kill the people she loves yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And I think he threatened the Hamia's family, too. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't have strong feelings about it. I was kind of getting bored of her being stuck in the castle. So I think I was looking forward to her branching out and going somewhere else. And we knew even then that Wendland, I think we knew that there was magic somewhere on that side of the continent or whatever. So I was yeah. looking forward to wherever that was going to lead her because yeah, it just seems like things were going to get more interesting. What did you think? Um, I remember feeling a little bit of apprehension. Um, it took me a really long time to get into Air of Fire too. Like I had to restart it multiple times, like the first chapter, not even the first full chapter, like the first half of the chapter over and over and over again. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so boring, which is like really lame and annoying of myself because now that I know what I know, I'm like, you should have just read it faster. You bitch. It was so yeah. good. You tortured yourself for no reason, Frida. You tortured yourself. Um, but anyway, I was a little apprehensive. I really wanted to see like her and Kale mend things and like get back together because I really enjoyed that relationship. I actually would have been okay with her getting with either Kale or Dorian, 
the like in the first throne of glass book like where kale is like leaning or laying on the ground talking to her through the actual fighting part to become the champion i'm like okay it's kale but i truly would have been happy if she was with either of them because i liked them both for her um but anyway um so i was a little apprehensive i wasn't sure how i felt about it um but uh yeah i guess i guess that's it for that one i mean we discover she's a lynn but we fucking knew that the whole time anyway right well, yeah, she tells so Kale well. and whatever Kale says as she goes that he loves her and she didn't say it back because you know she's conflicted on how she feels. Mm-hmm. And that's that before we go in to Air of Fire. So like I said before, like the beginning of it, she's like basically sitting on a roof roasting the whole time. And I was like, oh my God, I had to like reread that a bazillion times. God, I felt so bored at first and it didn't take long for it to stop being boring Were you bored, like, in the beginning of the book? Did it also take you a minute to, like, pick it up and, like, get going? Um, no. Once I got going, it was fine. I didn't feel like there wasn't anything, like, really pulling me in. Like, I, I can see how you thought it was boring. Like, there wasn't anything overly interesting happening for a while, actually. So, but I didn't struggle. Like, once I decided I was going to read it, I was like, nah, whatever start working my way through that's good it just took me so long to actually like get to the point where I would work my way through it like I said I started it and then started it over and then started it over and I'm like Jesus Christ girlfriend just actually sit there and read it for a minute and then I did and then I was grateful I did because then finally I allowed myself to get through but I think I was also in a bit of a reading slump at that moment also. So I think it was probably just an accumulation of a lot of various things in life and, you know, ebbs and flows. So it might have not just been the book. It could have just been me and life circumstance in that moment. Anyway, yeah. can't find passion for things all the time. Sometimes you do need like a good break from stuff mm-hmm. just in general. Yeah. Agreed. I never, ever, 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 ever want to go as long as I did before uh, not reading. Wait, did I years say that and right? years and years. <laughs> yeah, like a bazillion years, basically. Like, how old even am I? I am a fae. So, no, okay, I'm right, a witch. Right. I'm oh. a witch. No, a I would rather witch. be a fae. This or that, fae or witch. Me, fae. You, fae. Hundred yeah. percent. I just don't actually like the like steel or metal, whatever teeth and nails and stuff that they have. Well, I you actually- could be a crock and which then they don't have the iron teeth that sounds boring though we're gonna be fey fey's way better fey is way better okay so um what would you say the first heavy hitting moment for you in air of fire what was that for you um maybe um i can't remember what triggered it but i think rowan said something to Aelin and she had just finally fucking had it and she like packed up from Mistward and was like I'm fucking out of here and then um he was like still tracking her but she didn't know and then like the skinwalkers were gonna attack her and um yeah I think that that was the first moment that I was like he needs to like watch it like he's pushing her too much like he because she's not in his defense a little bit she's not telling him anything about what she's been through like she's being pretty secretive about stuff so I think he just assumes that she's a spoiled brat um mm-hmm. and he keeps pushing her and pushing her and he pushed her a little too far one day and she's like fuck this I don't need this shit yeah which to his defense like she also is super closed off this whole time which why would she share her life story to some dude anyway who was also a jerk to her from the beginning but I guess from the outside looking at him like if you would just tell him some of the stuff that you've been through, he maybe wouldn't be treating you the way that he's treating you. But it's always like when you're looking from the outside in, I actually forgot that that happened. I remember like the skinwalker moment, but I forgot like why that happened. So I like that you remembered that. And that was like a heavy hitting moment for you. Yeah. I couldn't remember <clears throat> what exactly triggered it. Like, did he say something to her? Cause I know that he reflected back later when he found out what happened to her back and that she was a slave. Um, Like he had reflected back and said, oh, fuck, like I did one time, you know, threaten her with, you know, is it going to take whipping you to get you to do something or whatever? And I wonder, I don't, I don't think that was it that triggered it, but anyways, 
Yeah. No say. That's okay. You know, um, there was a surprising moment for me, not even sure which order this is in, but when his buddy came in and wanted like the tattoos uh, done on him and she brought food up to him, like up to Rowan, like she was kind of worried about him, wondering what's going on. I was actually very surprised that she had those feelings about him and wanted to actually go up to see how things were going. That was surprising to me. That was another moment where he said something to her that was really hurtful. And then the old guy from the kitchens got onto him and was like, her mom was an advocate for us. And you be nice. Then he yeah, he was like, cake. stop breaking her. Like, she doesn't need you. Yeah, a kitchen guy was really sticking up for her. He was like, she doesn't need to be broken more. Like, like she's broken enough. Yeah. <laughs> she's had it. Like, actually, she needs some healing. Um, So in the cave, I was just wondering. So in the cave, like when she's on the frozen ice to save the other kitchen, dude. Oh, my gosh. I have dog Luca? hair all over me. Is this name Luca? Luca? I don't remember. <clears throat> or is it Lucas? I think it's Luca. <clears throat> Maybe Lucas sounds right. Luca. I don't know. Anyway. Kitchen boy. Kitchen boy. Cute guy. I like his personality. He's fun. I like all like all of these characters I'm actually really liking. Like I have fondness for them. Um anyway, he's like on the ice. He's like, yeah, I just, you know, I want extra credit or whatever it is he's there for, you know. And he's like, so are you gonna you gonna get me? You gonna give me some food? Like, can I get off this ice? And she's like, Oh fuck, I guess. So let me like try and do this. But did you think for a moment that there was going to be an evil creature in the water? Because I sure as fuck did. Um I wasn't surprised that there was, I mean, you know, they're setting the scene. Like it was clear when they went in there, there's like a bunch of discarded weapons. Like why would there be discarded weapons unless somebody like a bunch of people are dying there? I don't know, Frida, it made me, it really made me think of, um, did you watch Shrek growing up? Uh, Yeah. Okay. And you know, when like donkeys like walking through the castle to go get Fiona and so is, um, Shrek or whatever. And like everywhere, like just discarded armor and weapons and what, like, it's like, you know, it's a dragon's den, but there's no dragon. So they were setting, it felt like a similar scene, just like on mm-hmm. ice, whatever. So like they're setting it. Something is weird about the cave. Um, but I mean, I wasn't like on edge where I'm like, oh, for sure. I don't know. I didn't, I wasn't surprised. And I wasn't like so convinced at the same time. I think I was just reading through. I was totally on edge. That's funny because usually I'm the one that reading through. I'm like, even when reading it, they said that it was, there were no creatures in the water. Like she said, there were no fish and like whatever else, but I'm like, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we will see because I'm getting the vibes that there's something deep and dark and scary in there. Um, and I was right. So yay. Pat on the back to me. Um, yeah. I mean, I knew that like, it was going to be an interesting scene because it's like why go through all the trouble of setting up this whole thing with Luca mm-hmm. like why spend the pages if something significant wasn't going to come out of it yeah agreed and honestly like I love this part of the book because this is also the part where she like beats up Rowan and he maybe lets her but also I thought that was really fucking cool I'm like you get him Aelin and I felt like that was a moment where they earned a lot of respect for each other too and like now it's time where we could to be friends and possibly have a romance yeah which we still don't know but that's where I'm like finally because he took her to that cave too like right after I think um kitchen guy Emery's I think that's his name mm-hmm. um scolded him where and talked about his mother and like you don't need to keep breaking her so she was already on edge and like they were being sassy and rude to each other and um she he let her yeah put like beat the shit out of him for a sec because you know she was like no more she was like we're not she was like we're not jeopardizing any more people's lives like for training me or like whatever she's like that's enough like we're not it was just triggering like I don't want more people dying because of like my shit like that's you're you're a fucking idiot for like endangering him like that and he was like okay fair enough like I deserve this 
Yeah. Like, oops, didn't mean to do that. Now that actually begs the question when Emery says like, you be nice to her. And he's like, okay, I'm going to be nice. And the first thing he fucking does is take her to this cave over a frozen lake with this dude, Luca or Lucas on the ice. Like, how is that him being nice to her? And I know we get the sword out of it, but also did he actually know the sword was there the whole time? Or did he find it while he was rummaging while he was there? Like, you know what I mean? So it's like, why? How is that him being nice to her? I don't know. I think that's Rowan's way of being nice. I mean, Aelin doesn't need him to like, well, first of all, he's not going to just bend over and just all of a sudden be like, what do you need? Oh my God. How tell me about all your feelings. Let's just go for a walk in like a daisy field. Like he knows Aelin likes to like do fun, sassy things. So I think he just thought that this would be up her alley and she could like exercise get out some of her aggression, prove herself a little bit. Like it seems like a very Aelin style task. And I do think he probably knew it was there because he had given her that sword. We find out later, hoping she would figure out that this would be a good bargaining chip with um, Mav. Mm, Okay. Well, just interesting. Um, Okay. Let's switch gears over to Manon. Manon. Um, okay. So for her, like we're seeing her kind of break out of her shell a little bit, especially when she chooses a Braxos. I fucking loved that. I loved like seeing that the underdog is now becoming the overdog. (laughs) I don't know if that's a thing, but I loved that she chose him and like healed him all up and like seeing their relationship with each other and how he's like, he's kind of like a dog, but he's not, he's stubborn he they well they say they're they're intelligent like a dog but really like we're seeing that he's actually way more intelligent he has a lot of compassion he's also like super stubborn um and loves to smell flowers and like can tell when something's gross like you know the volg meats and stuff he's like hell no i'm not doing that um anyway i fucking love him i think he's super cute and he's my kind of dragon yeah, he's totally dog like. Yeah, like just like he likes to like sniff. He wants to nice sniffy nice flowers, which is so funny because he's like a mega killing beast, but like he just wants to like sniff the flowers sometimes. <laughs> it's so cute. But um, I love that she chose him because I he does seem very dog like, and I just always any kind of like injured animals I always have a hard time reading about. So like when we saw him coming out as like the bait. I was just really hoping that like he wasn't going to be killed as like the little bait for the bigger wyverns. I mean, no, it's so sad that they did that with all of these other little dudes. Um, and and then that's also like the speculation, like because he was so little, he had to really like think himself and like that maybe is why he's so smart because he didn't have like his muscles to rely on. He had to use his brains to like be smart about whatever it is he was doing. But he was broken. He was a broken dude, but she fixed him. So yay. She fixed him. Yeah. That's where we're starting to see those cracks in Manon where it's like, she's, she, it's like, she's trying to convince herself. She's like, I was born heartless. And her grandma's trying to reinforce. We don't have a heart. You don't have a heart. And she keeps like trying to remind herself of this thing. Like we don't have hearts, but like, we can see that it's like, she's trying to convince herself. Cause she has these cracks where it's like, wait a second, I shouldn't be doing these things or thinking these things or feeling these things, but she is. Mm -hmm. And I think Abraxas is kind of, kind of a catalyst for her in maybe realizing or coming to terms with the fact that like she has a heart and maybe it's okay too. And I mean, we're not, we're not there. She's not there, but it seems like he could be kind of the catalyst on getting her on that path. Yeah. Cause it definitely feels like it's happening. Um, And I also like sitting here talking about this. It makes me wonder like, why, why do they need to be so evil and heartless? Like, what is the benefit for these witches to be like that? I wonder like that's, um, well, I feel like that was the whole argument of the Crokin that, um, Manon's grandma made her kill at the very end just to reinforce the brutality in them when they thought that Manon was being soft. Um, that was the whole, that was that Crokin's whole point is like, I feel, we feel bad for you guys because like you raise each other to treat each other like shit and blah, blah, blah. And so it's like, mm-hmm. I felt like maybe there isn't necessarily a beneficial point to it. Um, other than, I mean, I guess if you raise everyone, like you don't have a heart, you are less likely to be vulnerable to 
things like love, I guess, which tends to get in the way for a lot of people. So if you don't love things, they can't be a weak spot if you're trying to like conquer and kill and whatever, you know? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> well, it's a bummer. And I really hope we get to see man in like, I don't know, grow and I don't know, grow a heart more and like maybe fall in love and man in, I have dreams for you. And if they don't come true, I'll be so sad. Um, just to finish up, I guess, yeah, we had heavy hitting moments with her. So just to finish that up. So one of the other heavy hitting moments we touched on was that moment. Oh, it was so heartbreaking to me when I think it was the blue blood air where she, they're in the war games and she's on her wyvern and the yellow legs air tells her wyvern to bite the other wyvern and it's dying and it's falling and she we know now she has like a connection with her wyvern because she like talked to manon about being able to talk to them so anyway hers is dying and it's trying to save her and then manon like goes to save which anyway that whole moment i was like i felt so bummed out like i felt really sad it's just like you know if a dog comes out to protect a human you know like say you're on a run and another scary beast came out and it is attacking you. Your dogs are going to attack it. But then what if it kills your dogs? Like that'd be really fucking sad and heartbreaking. And that is kind of like where my whole heartbreak moment was in. I was like, oh no, it's dying, but it's sweet because it's saving her. And like, of course, man is saving her. So that's another crack to her heart. But aside from that, like just the moment of that wyvern saving that other witch was like, that was sweet and sad. Yeah, very sad. I thought that was a really heartbreaking moment because we know um, Petra has a really special bond with her wyvern and she saw that Manon, whether or not Manon wants to admit it, um, also has that bond with her wyvern. And yeah, it was heartbreaking and it did break Petra. We did see at the end, like she wouldn't cut out of bed. Like it was like, you know, it's, it's like, it's almost like they have like a soul bond with these. Mm -hmm. Some of them have a soul bond with these creatures is what it feels like um and so it's like when they die it's just it's so heartbreaking because they yeah it was for protecting you and I'm sure that it's really multi-layered because it's for a fucking war game for a king that they probably don't even like like there are so many levels of this that probably make it really upsetting yeah agreed yeah Anyway. Oh, and the fucking yellow legs, the yellow legs just seem like, especially the, the air to the yellow legs just seems like the most wenchy wench of them all. Like she's such yeah. a fucking like instigating bitch. Like the rules were, you're not supposed to like kill or attack. And like, it was clear that like, she gave the order to like kill, you know what I mean? Both Petra and her wife. And so, heard it too. Yeah. Like it's just like, blah, she sucks. She super sucks. She's a bitch. We don't like her. No, we don't want love for her. I don't want redemption for her. You know, I love a redemption story, but not for that bitch. She does not get redemption. She sucks. So I guess the next person we could touch on would be Kale. And like, you already kind of touched on like how he does his loyalty shifts, but I don't know if there was more to it that you wanted to go over with him. Um, I don't really feel like there was a whole lot that was super interesting about Kale in this book to me, other than he's just being kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's just an annoying little bitch. <laughs> I felt like Dorian. So this is what's interesting because there was a bit of a switch because it's like in Throne of Glass at the end of Throne of Glass, when Selena was very clearly like going to be killed, Dorian was that he was more like, didn't know how to act. And like, he should have been there to like help her. And Kale was there. Like there was no second thought and Kale killed for her. Like there was no second thought about it. And Dorian was like more like tiptoeing around it. And then now comes air of fire. And Dorian is very clearly telling Kale. I mean, he didn't say it explicitly, but he was like, she's going to come back and you're going to have to decide like whose side you're on. And she was like, he was saying, you know, I know where I feel like I know where, how she's going to land for me, which it seems like he wants to ally with her. And like, he sees her as a friend. And it's just interesting that now Dorian has better convictions than Kale, if that makes sense. Yeah. I feel like Kale is struggling a lot. He is trying to figure out where his loyalties lie. And yeah. even Dorian is like calling him on his bullshit. Cause Kale is saying stupid shit. Like if we could just go back to when you didn't have magic and she wasn't Aelin and Dorian's like, we can't fucking do that. Like, that's not 
I am who I am. Like you don't get to pick and choose what pieces of us you like. Like that's not how life works, Kale. Like, yeah. I guess we can swing back to Aelin and Rowan. I just feel like the biggest thing for her, obviously, in this book is when she embraces her identity, like the Valg princes, Storm Mistward, Mistguard, Mistward. God damn it, Mistward. They storm Mistward. <laughs> and um they are attacking her. Like she's trying to keep the defenses up and they like start attacking her and like bringing her back through all of her terrible memories so we really get the full story of what happened um to Aelin the day that her parents died and like all of the things that she didn't want to face in detail and Frida I know you said that there was a moment in her telling that story that was like really Mm -hmm. touching to you do you want to talk about that I was sobbing I was so (laughs) fucking distraught this is the moment where I had the audiobook on and I was cleaning up um Charlie had gone over to her grandma's house and so I'm like you know just cleaning and listening and all by myself anyway um yeah just hearing that story and like her crawling into bed with her parents which I mean we had heard that part multiple times but like just like going through the motions of crawling into bed with the parents and then waking up and they're dead. And then hearing the next part where it's like the, her, um, I'm going to call her maid because I, I, I don't know what else it was to call her, her nurse maid. Okay. I was going to say nurse maid, but I was like, I don't know if that's the right word. Um, so anyway, her nurse maid like picks her up out of bed is not really talking about what happened, but it's like clear, like, okay, let's get her out of this bed from her parents her parents are dead and then you know basically shit's hitting the fan further I don't even remember I was so distraught but I just was thinking about like I don't know what it would be like if my little Charlie were to crawl into bed with me and Cam but we were actually dead and she wakes up the next morning and finds us dead like how fucking sad that would be and then further on the nursemaid is Marion her name's Marion Marion. Okay. Thank you. So Marion is now like run, run, run. Like this bad guy's coming right now. Like, let me give you some time. Like, obviously they probably both would have died had she stayed. So she's like, I'm going to buy as much time as I can for you run and hide and tell my daughter that I love her and like protect her and do all these things. Her daughter allied. What? Oh, her name. Yeah. Okay. okay. You're like, like huh? she lied. No. It's because I call her a lead. Oh, that's how I pronounce her name in my head. Oh, but a I... lied could be right. Well, I don't know. Have you heard them say it in the audiobooks? I don't know. Maybe. Okay. Anyway, um, so, um, even hearing that too, like the she's sacrificing herself so that Aelin can get away knowing that she has her very own daughter back home waiting for her and like shit's massively hitting the fan and to not be able to be there for her daughter to protect her daughter is also just really heartbreaking and it's such an impossible situation because it's like like what else would you have chosen like I mean she could have ran but the dude probably would have chased her anyway and like I don't know there's just there probably really wasn't any other way it was just heartbreaking it brings up lots of questions right because it's like did um what did I say her name is Marion <laughs> Marion yeah did Marion know that Selena or Aelin had on that um that necklace like did she know that that necklace was going to protect her no matter what also you know I feel like it's very possible she was just being as rational as possible she's like well either we both die or um maybe I can give her a chance to get away. Um, so I don't know. It seems like the choice was a really brave choice, but it kind of seemed like the one that made the most sense, even with her daughter in mind. Cause she's like, well, if we both die, that's not going to help anything. But if I can give Aelin a chance and she believed in what Aelin could be one day, like maybe she just knew, I mean, that's better than, first of all, it's better than both of them dying, but also maybe she knew that that was her daughter's best shot at a, a better life when possible when Aelin is ready yeah very true um also the whole scene then ends like with uh Aelin Selena Aelin like going into the water and surviving whatever but then 
um fuck what's his name the king of the assassins Arabin. Arabin, yeah like where was he why was he there i mean she must have like gone downstream at some point right if she was in the water for a while but also it's just i, I don't really know but like where did he come into play? Like, what was he doing there? Why was he there? And was he the one that just killed Marion? Like, was he there the whole time? And then he found Aelin later. We don't know how long she was out because it sounds like she got knocked out or passed out. So, and I don't know if we'll ever find the answers to that, but I am wondering, like, was that a random Kingsman that came to kill them or to dispatch them, to unalive them, if you will, or was it him? But if it was him, how did he find her? I mean, he could have tracked her. I don't fucking know. What was he doing there? Why was he there? Well, and question, like, did the king see, and this is why I'm not super far into Assassin's Blade. So did the king employ their services, like Arabin services? Did he use them or no? Um, I don't think so from what I can remember. So they, so. so um, okay. So it's not like the King was hiring as far as we know, at least in Assassin's Blade, they weren't getting jobs from the King. They were like doing their own shit for I think so. own gain, I guess, maybe. I think so. I could be okay. wrong, but I think so. And I think like, um, they were just doing it all under the King's, excuse me, under the King's nose. So I don't okay. remember. I don't think so though. I don't recall there being a moment. Okay, that wrong. makes sense because I felt like it would be different if the king had. We know from Assassin's Blade that the king was very clearly working with Arabin and like hiring him and using his services. But if that's not true, then it's harder to draw that connection. Mm -hmm, exactly. <sighs> well, anyway, yeah, that part was like super heartbreaking for me. Bah, 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 bah. Literal, like I had to stop everything and message you guys. I was like, you guys. My chest hurts. My face is burning from the tears. So oh. sad. It was so sad. Uh, okay, so I wanted to switch over back to Rowan because we also had this big conversation about mates. And um, so Rowan had a mate that died. And then we were like, what? He already had a mate, but he was supposed to be Aelin's mate. And so then we're <laughs> like, can you have multiple mates? What a selfish asshole for having another mate. So it's, you know, there was that whole. <laughs> yeah, there's that whole thing that just brings into question. It just seems like, obviously we know um, Rowan and Aelin now have some sort of bond. They have a Karanim bond, which is very, very rare. They almost made it seem like it's more rare than a mating bond. And it just begs the question. And this is what's interesting is because this is Sarah J. Mass's first series, but it's the last one that we've read. So every time we've had a mate in all of her other books, like we've just seen one and like it, I, I've never, we've never gotten to hear about somebody's mate dying, at least not from a main character. So it just, yeah. Do there get to be multiple? Like what the fuck's going on here? Mm -hmm, exactly. Well, and then also I am again, always too scared to look things up because I really don't want spoilers, but um, I wonder if the mate in this book is different from what we read in the further books because maybe it morphed being that it was her first series I just wonder if she was able to further expand on what a mate was and the bond that existed with that mate so I'm just saying like there could be a possibility that Rowan and Aelin could still be mates maybe and I don't know maybe this is just helpful thinking yeah, I don't know. I think that it's possible. And then also maybe it's just possible that they can just have, I don't know. It feels like they are mates though. They're giving mate vibes, but we'll see what They're happens. Mate vibes. But could you imagine like feeling all of these mate vibes with them and then her actually getting a different mate because now they have a Karen Am bond that he ended up, ends up doing the blood oath. So now he has like two different soul bonds with her. Plus if they're not actually mated, which, you know, would be a three for three, if they're not actually mated and she has somebody else, like, what would that relationship look like? And like, would that be weird? I guess, like, would there be fighting? I just feel like maybe the mate bond isn't always the end all be all because two examples come to mind. So like when, um, 
Bryce and talked about his mother and father being mated, it didn't actually sound like they had a very good marriage. Like they just happened to be mated and like they made the best of it, but like it wasn't a good situation. And we'll see what happens because I know we'll learn more about um, Elaine, I think in the upcoming books, but it doesn't seem like she's particularly fucking pleased to be mated with Luchin. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that we've seen it be beautiful and amazing, but it seems like there have been hints of examples of it. Like it's not everything and it doesn't always work out in that perfect dreamy way. Yeah, that makes sense. It reminds me of that one book that we read that I did not super love. Um, where there was like that DNA testing to like find your oh, match. Oh yeah. Um, the one or something. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I think that is what it's called. The one. Yeah. That one was interesting. I mean, before we find out, well, okay. Anyway, I'm just saying like, that was interesting because like there were some people that claimed to have been matched and then really like they maybe weren't the most compatible. Like maybe it's a serial killer with a cop or something, you know, like you just don't fucking know. Um, anyway, so I digress. <laughs> um, Why did he already have a mate? <laughs> but it is, it, there is, there was still a moment too that stuck out to me in Air of Fire when they're sitting in the tree. I think they were, you know, investigating some of those demi deaths and she was talking about Kale. Like, could Kale have been my mate? And Rowan asked her a question, do you want to know the truth? And she said something like, not tonight or not right now. So it just felt like there was a moment too, where it's like he had something more to say about it and she wasn't ready for it. So then that just, that little nugget got slid in there and then it just hasn't come back up. Yeah. That's so funny because you were like, they were in the tree. I was like, no, they were in the laundry room. (laughs) What? (laughs) This is why, because I was listening to that part too. And I was in the laundry room. That's so fucking (laughs) funny. I know. So like they were in the tree. Bitch, they were in the laundry room. What was I thinking? Do you think that it's interesting that she would wonder if Kale was her mate and not Sam? Um... Uh, because don't you feel like she even says, I feel like she loved, like she knew she loved Sam. Like it seemed like she loved him more. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's true because Sam and her really, really were super, super close, but she lost her virginity to Kale. So I don't know. I'm not sure there, there were a lot of like big bonds that were happening in the, in the book that I was like, uh, like, okay. So like with her and Nehemia, like with how intense this bond was with her and like how distraught she was. And I know everyone's like, eh, it was the last straw that broke the camel's back. But honestly, like, as I'm reading it, I'm like, why is this such a big deal? Like, why do we care this much? Like, yeah, it's sad. We should care some, but like, why do we care as much as we do? Because I did not see that you guys were as close as you were. And then, you know, you step back and it's like, oh, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. And she had so many people that she lost. And like, this is triggering, triggering for her, but that's like all excuses for this big relationship that the author, maybe because she was such a new author, she didn't get the chance or ability. She didn't have the ability yet to like grow as big of a bond as she does. Cause even queen of shadows, like that book is like way better than these other ones to me. Like, I feel like the writing is like better. You're getting more, I don't know, bonding, And so that to also say with Kale, like maybe that was kind of the same thing. Like maybe the writing just wasn't there to make it show as deeply as the author was actually intending it to be. Maybe. I don't know. I think the Nehemia thing still makes a lot of sense to me because she had said this repetitively and she had said this multiple times. It's like all of the people who were doing all of the things for their people, all of the right things, fighting for their people and like holding their responsibilities. Like her parents were killed. And like, then she was supposed to be responsible for the people of Terrison and she never stepped up to it. And then Nehemia was killed and she was the one fighting for her people. And like, she was a queen who was like taking responsibility and not hiding. And Selena is constantly hiding. And then all of these good people who are doing the right things that she is supposed to be doing are killed and then she's still alive and she's like what the fuck why am I the one that's still alive so I think there's like a lot of frustration in there too where it's like the all of the people who were doing the stuff are not surviving and I'm still here so then it just makes her feel even more like a piece of shit and then what the fuck am I doing and then obviously we finally see her like 
embrace her responsibility. But mm-hmm. true points, points are being given. And I accept them. Maybe more like for me, it was like when she died, the intensity of immediately dropping her love for Kale to kill him. That was like super shocking for me. The ruminating on it after I still was like, eh, I don't know. But then when like, we've talked about this before. So like, as you're giving these points and then you say them again, it's another refresher for me to be like, okay, yeah, the ruminating on it, that makes more sense. But like in the moment, I'm like, why, why are we doing this? Like, why are we trying to kill Kale? Yeah. Nice. It just seems like it. Yeah. I agree. I felt like her reaction didn't make any, it made sense, but it was like an overreaction. I was like, what the fuck? Like, yeah, the Kale thing, it just seemed like how she dropped him. It felt really a little easier than it should have been. Yeah. And there like, were a lot of parts in this book that was like that. And I just feel like she kind of didn't really give him the benefit of the doubt. Like obviously Kale like fucked up, but he was also like, he didn't ever have any ill intentions. Like he made a mistake. Like, let's keep in mind, like he's in his early twenties, like they're figuring shit out. He doesn't know everything that's going on with the King. She also, yeah, there's just so many parts to it where it's like, I don't think he ever had ill intentions. He fucked up. Yes. But he was also trying to protect her. So. Yeah. I don't think that he was thought it was going to go as far as it was, because if I remember the King also had him add extra guards to her because there was a hit out on her. And the king wanted to meet with her later. It did sound at all times. It sounded like two completely separate things were going on. And in fact, that's what happened. Somebody had a hit out on her, but she did have extra bodyguards on. And the king specifically told him not to tell Selena about it because she's always getting in the way. Her, you know, she's always, uh, she's a busybody. She's in the way. And the king's like, no, I don't want her in the way. Um, And then yes, he was going to have his conversation with her. I I wonder if the king was going to kill Nehemia also, like if that was part of his plan or what he, maybe he was going to try to put a ring on her finger, which, at, or, or one of the callers, which we didn't know existed at the time, but maybe he was going to try and control her somewhere. Somehow. Yeah, I guess we'll never know. We'll never know. Um, okay. So then I guess our like final overall heavy hitting moment is where, I mean, we already touched that Aelin and Rowan have the Karen Am- bond but that is how Aelin is ultimately able to destroy the Vogue princes it's where she's like I'm Aelin like this is it like I'm this person and then the best part of all which again felt a little bit too easy when she gets to free Rowan from his blood oath from Maeve and Maeve is like terrified of Aelin's fire which she like lights up the whole fucking town not to burn them but like Damn, Aelin, that was really fucking cool. You're badass. Um, and then he ends up giving Aelin a blood oath. That was really cool. All of that happened so fast. Um, question, because I can't remember. So Brandon, this is just coming up because you're talking about breaking the blood oath. And obviously we find out that um, Maeve, she was not interested really in how much of Mav's power Selena had. She wanted to know how much of Brandon's power that Selena, not Selena, Aelin had. Um, and Brandon, he was a god, right? He was not just a fae. He was a god. So his power was like almighty. Googling. <laughs> I felt like there was something about him that was extra. I think he's a god. Careful though, because there could be spoilers. Okay, so what I'm reading without clicking on anything, Brandon was an exceptionally skilled warrior, but by far his most well-known ability was his fire magic, blessed by Mala, one of the gods. Brandon was feared, dot, dot, dot. So I don't know if he was actually God. He was blessed by one of the gods. Interesting. Okay, yeah, so then perhaps he is just a fae. Yeah. Um he was a fake king. So yeah, if it says he's fake, then I guess he's not a god. There's just something about him that I thought was a little extra oomphy, you know. He was blessed. Maybe that's why, because he was specifically blessed by this person. Okay. Oh, right. And we talked about this too, like the Brannon um Alina connection, because technically. Aelin and Dorian are like very distant relatives because Brannon was the 
father of Alina, who married Gavin the Haviliard. So that's how they're all connected. Mm, okay, okay. Oh, I love this fucking series. That's something that's like so wild to me is like, I love The Court of Thorns and Roses. I did not think it would be possible for me to love anything else. Um, and then I loved Crescent City after I got past that jumbly moment where I'm like, insert all of these sums and equations above my head. Like what the fuck is actually happening? All of these words. Once I got past that, um, about probably 10 chapters in, um, I fell in love with that series too. And I was like, I still loved A Court of Thorns and Roses more, but I loved that series. Now this turn of glass one, uh, it took me a minute, but my God, I love it again. Like I had no idea that I could love another series and SJM is worth all the hype all of the fucking hype she's so talented kills it every time and she's a fast writer too or maybe she wrote them a while ago and they're getting published so soon thereafter didn't the court of thorns and roses come out in 2020 um I don't know that might have come out in 2020 I wonder when the first throne of glass came out actually it says may 5th 2015 is when it was originally published why did i think that 2015 oh sense. interesting um well in Thorn yeah. of glass came out in 2012 so but anyways well some mm-hmm. of her newer ones though i mean they've the newer renditions whatever they've been coming out recently so i think perhaps i was picking up steam court mystery 2016 then 2017 then 2018 for a court of frost and starlight and then there was a gap. So from 2018, there wasn't a new one until 2021, which was the Court of Silver Flames. Yeah. After I said that, and I actually looked it up and fact checked myself, I realized I was sorely wrong. She is not a fast writer. <laughs> the last book we have from A Court of Thorns and Roses is 2021. So really, we're in 2023 and we deserve another one. And I did read an article from her where she's talking about how um it just takes time and she's like intermingling these worlds but she wants them to also be standalone books like she doesn't want people to feel like they have to read x book in order to read this series you know which I actually appreciate and I can imagine that does take a lot of work and just making sure that things line up so hoping for something soon and what she does do she is writing multiple stories simultaneously because I know when she was wrapping up throne of glass I think the last couple of those books she was started a court of thorns and roses so she's like in this land writing this new land and then we see we she's wrapped up um throne of glass and so now we're in a court of thorns and roses land and she's also writing crescent city at the same time it's not like she's wrapping up one series and then doing another it's like her head is like i don't know Mm -hmm. how she keeps track of everything yeah i have no idea she has massive talents that's for damn sure um okay well those are our heavy hitting moments i think there's nothing else that i think i wanted to touch on is there anything else you wanted to touch on um no i think the last big thing is the oh shit of you know uh dorian gets the collar on him Mm -hmm. were you surprised by that yes and no i was sad about it surprised i'm not sure definitely um was not happy about it but I knew something was going to happen more than just somebody dying. I actually was scared Kale was going to be killed. I thought somebody else was going to be killed. I was surprised that all three of them survived. Well, oh yeah, Adian, because he got put in jail. I did kind of think Adian uh, was going to die when he stepped up like that because he was even prepared to die himself. And then, yeah, how cute. He was like going to take it for Kale. He was like, nope, I'm going to go. He put himself out there. And he did it for Aelin too, because he assumed that, you know, she might still love him and whatever. So anyways, yeah. <clears throat> should we move on to some trivia? Trivia, trivia. I'm going first. Fine. Whatever. All right. I got five questions for you. Are I've... you ready? Hit me. Hit me, baby, one more time. All right. Number one. These are fucking dumb. I'll tell you right now. Number one. <laughs> Where was Nehemia from? Oh, shit. Ilwe. Oh, okay. I call it Ilwe. Ilwe. You're probably right. I just had to pull it out of my ass. I saw like the E and there's a W and an L and a Y and an E. You know so it's I was in like, there. You're like, I can give you the I letters. S- 
<laughs> All right, good job. That's one out of five. Okay. Where do the witches want to live again? The waste. Ah, you're so good at this. Okay, who said this? No, our greatest secret is that we pity you. Oh, that Kraken um, prisoner that they made Manon kill at the end. Fine. Uh, yes. Okay. I'm telling you, these are just dumb. Like, I can't. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Where do they take Caltane? Um, Marath. Good job. Final question. How many swept? How many cells dwell beneath the castle's library? Oh, how many? Yeah. I truly don't know. Uh, 10. <laughs> 198. <laughs> okay. In no way was I going to get that. That was five. That's five questions. That's five. That was five questions. You got four out of five. Well done. Well done. Did you say 198? 198. Wow. Yep. Very specific. Interesting. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't get that. You're like, how could you forget this fact? <laughs> um, all right, are you ready? Uh, no, I'm not. I know these are all gonna be horrible. You're no, no, see, no, no, I no, no. pull out easy ones and you're gonna pull out all the hard ones. I'm gonna die. This is okay. it. I don't like some of these, but okay, we're going for it. <clears throat> In Air of Fire, what is Dorian's lover's name? Oh, Sorsha. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um okay yeah. what is rowan's mate's name oh um i don't emily okay i'm not actually sure how you say it for sure but i had been in my head saying lyria or is it lyria it's l-y-r-i-a lyria or lyria I think it's going to be lyria because I have a buddy who named their kid lyra and they spell it just like that but without the i Oh, at the well, end, I think Lyria oh, yeah. is prettier in my personal is. opinion, but I agree. Um, I concur. Who is Keely? Um, who is Keely? Can I get a hint of like what book she's in? Keely is in Air Fire. <sighs> she wasn't all that cool. Um, Keely, Keely. Who is Keely? Do, 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 do. I don't fucking know. Do you want a hint? Sure. Okay. Um, it has to do with Manon's story. Well, Manon's side of the books. <sighs> I don't know. Okay. It's Petra's Wyvern. Ah, cute. Ah, Keely's the one that dies. She's the one that died. They're so sad. Okay. I'm just going to pause this to say, I just like cheered myself answering the first question correctly. And I realized that you might be listening and have never listened to our podcast before. Let me just say, I fucking suck at trivia. Every time we do trivia, I fail. So the fact that I got the first question right, I was like so excited thinking, you know, I'm a fucking winner. I'm going to win this one. Hard am not. I've already failed it too. You're winning no matter what. All right. You may continue. <clears throat> um, What did Aelin tell tell kale before she left in the hopes he'd figure out who she is she said yes she did say but what did the what was it i was but 12 i was but eight i was but nine when the magic ended and i lived in terrison and i was an only child no did you say <laughs> um okay he she gave kale a date it was a month and a day with no year attached i'll give you half a point if you can tell me the significance of this date it was her birthday no it wasn't <laughs> god damn it <laughs> there's no um there's no year attached so anyways it was oh. the day that she snapped at end of year and it was the day that her parents died those were the same mm. anyways so then he, kale went back and he looked through the records like 10 years ago and saw who like what was the news that day on that and whatever and then he sees oh fuck and then aelin anyways so. that was also the day that she had a meltdown or like a moment where she just needed a day to herself and she like took off 
Well, yeah. She was at the castle too. Okay. I think so. Probably that same day. So last question. <clears throat> what is the name of the servant that um, helped Sel- like serve Selena in the glass castle? She was given like someone. Oh, uh, I know her. <laughs> she wasn't. Yeah, she definitely obviously wasn't an heir of fire because Selena wasn't really there. So I'm remembering like an I and a GH in that name. There are two I's in it. There's uh. a there's a P. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. But if I read it, I would know it. And I read it recently and I'm like, why can't I remember her name? Her name was PP. Princess PP. Princess PP. No, I don't fucking know. It's Philippa. Bullshit is what it is. The fact that I got one out of four and you got four out of five really. No, I got one out of five and you got four out of five. Really? Grinds my gears. My gears are successfully grounded. Well, and now I just feel mean. You're a meanie. You're a meanie poo poo head. Like, how you don't dare even you? love me. Well, anyway, overall book grading, I'm going to move straight on to that. For me, I love the fucking series. So right now I'm at a five out of five because I oh. fucking, I could not give Crown of Midnight that high of a score. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm like, that doesn't fit Crown of Midnight. Definitely not a five out of five. No, that would be like a three out of five. However, Air of Fire, I really fucking loved it. Maybe I could say a four out of five, 4.5. Or four. I don't know. I rated highly. I highly rate it. Suggested read. I'd give Crown of Midnight. Yeah, Crown of Midnight, I'd give like a 3.2. And then Air of Fire, I think, deserves a solid four. Yeah. Solid numbers for definitely. Air Fire. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't give Air Fire a five for sure not. I don't think it was like the most mind-blowing amazing book I've ever read because even you said in the beginning it felt slow to you so if god damn it you're right and I forgot I had like a whole rating scale I was giving myself I always struggle with what I want to rate things because it's like I love the series I never want to deter people from reading it if I like it even though several of the books were slow fine I agree with that a five is probably too significant talk to me again at queen of shadows well, you did say four out of five, though. You had already downgraded. Okay. But I also so. was like still wishy-washy in my head. Ultimate yeah. answer, four out of five for the whole shebang. Boop, boop. Um, and that's all that we have for you guys. Um, I believe we will be recapping Queen of Shadows on its own, but we've got a couple of other books coming up for you guys first, including mm-hmm. Daisy Jones and the Six. And we'll have ZA4 coming out for you guys here shortly also. And yes. Spare, we will be recapping that for you wenches. Yeah, there. so actually Spare is coming first. That one will come out March 6th, as long as all goes well. Um, And then right after that is Daisy Jones. What's cool about the Daisy Jones coming out is this is totally not even intentional, but it's coming out March 20th. And it's also coming out into theaters. Like, so they created a movie for it and it's also coming out in March. So that's kind of cool. We did not plan this, but that's what's happening. Another exciting thing that's up and coming um, is as long as all goes well, we currently have scheduled with uh, author Caitlin Zura to meet with her. Um, That airs on February 27th. So that will be our BS week where we will have some book tea. And then, oh, I guess that's next week. Fun fact. Fun fact. Fun fact Coming for up. you. Next well, week. Well, no, not next week for Caitlin. them. Next week for us. And then they'll have it. It airs in a no. couple weeks for them. No. Nah. This right now airs the 20th. And then the actual Caitlin airs the 27th. Exactly a week from when they're listening to it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Because we're recording this on the 10th. Hello? Behind the curtain of the podcast. Hello, team. brain. Am I here? <laughs> You're here. We're it's fine. We're just giving you guys some behind the scenes. Anyway, um, on that note, again, please remember to give us a rating for real. It helps us so much. And I'll tell you what, the first person, the first five people that give us a rating on whatever like platform you're listening on and message us on Instagram 
I will buy you coffee. Send us, a, send us a screenshot. If you guys give us a rating, send us a screenshot and we will send you a coffee, some funds for your coffee. Yes, which is quite the handy situation. If you ask me, give us a rating and send us a DM, screenshot the rating that you gave, and then we will send you the money through Venmo, or we can send you a QR code to scan, you know, at Starbucks or whichever coffee place you want. So yeah. anyway, first five people. So hurry fast, be one of those five. We appreciate you. We love that you're here listening and yeah. Catch you on the flip side, book sleuths. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> I live inside my own world of make-believe.